We never coordinate all of these things all that well. And I don't know, if, in fact, I'm pretty certain Andrew did not know that the title of today's message is Praying God's Way. <laughs> so God knows what He's doing, doesn't He? And it's just, it's just amazing to follow the Holy Spirit and to see what He does as He leads and guides and directs us. Before we get into this Word today, praying God's way, let's just all bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much that we, our cries go into the ears of the Master, Father God, that when we feel like our ship is sinking, Father God, that You are in full control. And You are the God who says, Peace, be still. And Father God, the seas and the winds must obey Your voice, Father God. And so we thank You, Father God, that we have Your ears, we have Your attention right now as we cry out to You, Father God. May Your Spirit just come and sweep through this place. Lord God, may You walk the aisles. May You be the speaker of the hour. Get me out of Your way. That You would come and have Your way, Father God, and to teach us how to pray Your way. Father God, how to speak to You as Your Word instructs us to. Father God, give us eyes that see what You see and ears that hear what You're saying to Your church and hearts to receive that Word, Father God, that it would bring forth much fruit, some 30, 60, and even a hundredfold harvest in this place and in our lives and in our community. We just thank You, Lord God, for what's about ready to happen as You come and just make Yourself known in this place. For it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. As I was looking at prayer, I was thinking about children, and they can say the, some of the funniest things. I heard about a mom who was cooking pancakes one morning for her two boys. Uh, Kevin was the older boy, he was five, and then the younger brother, Ryan. And they were squabbling back and forth about who was going to get the first pancake. And mom saw this as an opportunity to teach them a lesson, and she said, well, boys, you do know that if Jesus were here, he would tell his brother that he could have the first pancake. And they just kind of sat there with their arms folded, and she finally looked at him and said, I'm waiting. And finally, the older brother, Kevin, looked over at Ryan. He said, hey, Ryan, this time you be Jesus. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I love that. There was a little boy praying. He said, Lord, if you can't make me better, don't worry. He said, don't worry about it. I'm having a real good time just the way I am. <laughs> a mom overheard her kids praying and then trying to recite the Lord's Prayer. And, and I've always loved this. You know, she heard, she heard him say, our Father who does art in heaven. <laughs> and somebody here this morning ought to like this. He, he said, Howard be thy name. <laughs> He wanted to say, give us this day our jelly bread. And everyone said, Amen. And he said, forgive us the trash in our baskets as we forgive the others who put trash in our baskets. And if you think about that, that's not too bad of a, of a paraphrase. Has anybody been putting trash in your basket that you need to forgive? And I love the other one that said, forgive us our texts as we forgive those who text against us. And that one is very relevant for many of us. See, today we're talking about praying God's way. And I think a lot of us, when we pray, we sound a lot like those kids to God. A lot of us, when we pray, our, our prayers, they're not developed. And they're not the best, maybe. And I think He probably gets a lot of amusement sometimes out of the way we sound. And, and He loves us just speaking to Him, even if it isn't eloquent, even if it isn't great, even if honestly sometimes we have our theology a little messed up. But what God is saying this morning is this, is He reminded me that the Bible says in 1 John 5 that if we ask anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, we know that we have the requests we would desire of Him. And so He promises us if we will pray according to His will... And His will is simple. It's His Word. If our prayer life will line up with His Word, if we will ask the things that He desires according to His will, we will have answers to our prayers. And while I sense that I should call this sermon praying God's way, really the thrust of this sermon is this, is how to have your prayers answered. 
It's how to pray in such a way that you're going to see the answers to your prayers. Anybody, I don't need to ask this, I hope, but how many of y'all want to see your prayers answered? Yeah. You want, you want to see the things you've been asking God about to come to pass. You want to see breakthrough. You want to see breakthrough in your life and and in your family and in your home and your community. You want to see God moving you forward in Him. You want to see things happening. And so this morning, praying God's way isn't praying in such a way that we see His kingdom come, we see Him move. It's praying in a mature and effective way. And so James chapter 5 verse 16 says... Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And he goes on to say, the effective fervent. That effective fervent means earnest and heartfelt. It doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's the most well-spoken, but it's spoken with from the heart. It's spoken with earnestness. It's spoken with desire and faith. The, earn, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much and, and the righteous man, how many of y'all know that the only way we can come to God is through the shed blood of Jesus? It's Jesus' righteousness alone that makes us righteous. So the, listen, the effective fervent prayer of someone who's been covered by the blood of Jesus avails much. The word avail means it's full of power. Hallelujah. And it's able to release mighty power that is available. He goes on to describe this through the the prophet Elijah. He goes on to say, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. In other words, he was a human being with flaws, mistakes, and emotions just like we have. And so I believe he's using Elijah as an example, not only because he had a powerful prayer life, but because he also made mistakes like we do. And so he's giving us an example that no one here can say, well, you know, Elijah was perfect. He goes on to say, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Imagine this. He walks up to King Ahab, king of Israel, who could have killed him right there, and he says, it shall not rain or even each other be due on the ground, except at my word. He has such confidence in his prayer life. He says, unless I pray and ask for rain, you're not going to see any rain. You're not even going to see a drop of moisture on the ground. And he just walked away. And it says in verse 18, this is three and a half years later, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. After three and a half years of no rain, no dew, he has the showdown on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. I mean, if you all remember this, he calls fire down of heaven that consumes the sacrifice. He slays the false prophets of Baal in front of everybody. And then he walks back up to Ahab. He hasn't seen him in three and a half years. And he says, in the middle of a great drought and famine, he says, you know, I think it's time for you to go eat and drink. Because I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. I love how he says that. He doesn't just say, I hear a sprinkle coming. He says, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. How many of you know that our God is the God of more than enough? And some of us, He's waiting for us to pray in faith and speak to Him like He's God. The Bible says that without faith it's impossible to please Him because he who comes to God must believe that He is. And that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And so today we're learning to pray God's way according to His Word. Jesus in John 15, 7, I love this scripture. He said, if you abide in me, if you walk in fellowship with me, if you stay close to me, and my, notice this, my words abide in you. If you will walk in close fellowship with me and get my word down in your heart, what will happen? You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Those are from the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.
I'm not making this up. I'm just reading and quoting what he said. He said, if you will walk close to me and you'll get my word in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. The same Jesus said, if you will pray in faith, even with just a mustard seed, but you'll begin to exercise it through prayer, you will say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. The same Jesus said, and nothing, nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing. So how is it possible that the church has been largely ineffective in prayer? How is it, in light of everything Jesus said, in light of what the Scriptures tell us about the effectiveness and the promise The promise of answered prayer, how is it that we could possibly be ineffective? And I would share today that I believe the biggest thing in our life, it is a great blessing, but it is also a great burden and distraction, is all the stuff around us. Someone once said that the purpose of social media is so that when we stand before God, we will not be able to say we did not have time to pray. Come on, church. Don't lose me now. It's because I'm preaching. I'm thankful for this device. Every week, and I'm not... I'm, please don't take this boasting. This is celebrating. It shocks me. But every week, over a thousand people will watch this service. God is using this church so far beyond what we can see with our eyes. And and listen, it'll be on TV four times this week all around our region here at different times. Yeah. And so God is using the screen, the big screen, the little screen called your, your cell phone. Mine's especially small. I know that's not cool, but it's portable. And so we have this device that's just amazing. I mean... Everything is on this thing. Everything is compacted into this one device. I can talk. I can text. I can message. I can Google. I can get on, on social media. I can listen to music. I can get put GPS and I can follow this thing. I can put all different kinds of apps. I've got my calculator. I've got my planner. I've got my calendar. I've got everything on this thing. My whole world is compacted onto this thing. And so you would think, well, that, that, that's amazing. In a lot of ways it is. But here's the truth. This thing is addictive. Yes. There, all through this room, you are addicted to the buzz and the vibration of this thing. It gives you a buzz when it buzzes. <laughs> and you get a little jolt of adrenaline when you hear the ping. And whether it's a ping, a buzz, or a ring... You can't resist the lure of this thing going off. Every noise it makes, you have to look at it. You have to pick it up. You have to see what's going on there. I just moved it and it lit up. It's saying, look at me, John. I know you're trying to preach, but give me your attention. It's constantly asking for our attention. Do you know that the average American is spending, listen, five hours a day on their phone? And I realize a few of you don't have a phone, but realize you are in the vast, vast minority. God bless you. Honestly, I wouldn't recommend you get one. (laughs) But that amounts to five years and four hours of our life staring at a screen. The average teenager isn't spending five hours a day. Listen to this, Chris. Your average youth is spending nine hours hours a day staring at this thing and some of you adults are doing the same thing. Listen, that amounts to 24 years if they keep that up. 24 years of your life on something that honestly isn't real life. You're looking at all these pictures of people on family vacations and they look so happy. Have you ever taken pictures with kids? (laughs) That's not real. (laughs) 
The one kid's just giving that funny looking smile because the other one just pinched him. <laughs> and this next one smells funny and they're all laughing at him. It's not real. You can, you can edit those things. You can tuck stuff in. You can puff things out. You can make them look more handsome. You can put hair on the head. <laughs> and so we're all distracted by this thing that's not real. Meanwhile, there's real people all around me. I've got real people, real brothers and sisters in Christ, real friends, real family. I serve a real God above all. There's a real world with a real God and a real Savior. And while this saint is addictive, he wants us to crave him. The psalmist wrote, listen, he says, My heart and my flesh cry out for you, the living God. I love Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul longs after thee, the living God. How many of you all want more of God's presence, more of God's blessing, more of God's anointing? It's time the church learned to set down the distractions sometimes and get our eyes on the main attraction. And His name is Jesus! Paul said, this one thing I do. And so this morning, the first step in praying God's way is number one, to find your focus. Find your focus. Get your eyes on Jesus. And most of the Scripture we're going to read is going to be from the teachings of Jesus, the bulk of it. We're going to look at some other passages. But turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, speaking of finding your focus, Jesus said in verse 5, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, as someone who pretends to be someone that they're not. All right? Listen, before I can talk about my public prayer life, it must first be backed up by a private prayer life. So he says, for they love to pray standing where? In the synagogues and on the corners of the streets. In other words, they pray to be seen, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. He said, I guarantee you this, they've already received all the reward they're going to get. Their reward is that everyone around them thinks that they have a great prayer life. But the thing is, is that God knows what the truth is. And so he's going to teach us how to pray his way. Don't pray that way. Don't pray to be seen. Don't pray to talk about how much you pray. It says in verse 6, But when you pray, go into your room. That, that, word, that word in the Greek means like uh, the most inner room. It's like it was almost often a storage room, to be honest with you. It's why the old King James says, go into your closet. Go into your storage room or the privacy room. It's the most private place in the house. And notice this. And when you have what? Shut. In other words, and when you have removed the distractions. Real prayer cannot happen until I shut the door. And we have become so addicted. You know what? And people get mad at you if you're not addicted. They Listen, just because you message somebody, they are not obligated by God to respond to you in 3.2 nanoseconds. Somebody will message, Pastor, where were you? I'm like, I had a meeting. I was meeting with the most important man, not in the world, but in all of creation. Huh? You want a pastor that comes with a word from the throne room, but you want him to be available to you every nanosecond of every little need you have. If you need me that much, you need to learn to talk to God a little more. Come on. You want a pastor that prays as long as he doesn't pray when you need him. You want a pastor that reads the Bible as long as it doesn't interrupt your schedule. Don't talk to me anymore about I wasn't there when you called. I 
know someone who was available when you called. Come on, church. We've got to get mature about these things. When you have shut the door, then pray to your Father. And I love this phrase, who is in the secret place. Do you notice what he just said? You shut the door, and guess who's already waiting on you? We just walked into the place of meeting when we shut the door and the distractions. And all of a sudden I realized that I am not in any ordinary presence. I'm in the secret place with my Heavenly Father, the Creator of heaven and earth. And He says, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. When we go to meet with God, He comes to meet with us. And when we shut the door to the distractions, He says, they really, really want to see me. They really, really want to hear my voice. Some of you aren't even looking at me in the eyes anymore. God loves you anyways. I heard a famous pastor talking about how he's he's been to see more than one president. And you know before you go into the Oval Office, you know the first thing they do is, is security guard pulls out a basket and he says, give me your phone. And the reason is, is because the president doesn't want anybody in there that's distracted. We're to show respect, but also we're to not waste his time. You've been given 24-7 unlimited access to the presence of Almighty God. And the only thing he's saying is, put the distractions in the basket. Because you're about ready to step onto holy ground. Jesus said it this way in the parable of the seed and the sower, that some of the seed fell on the path, the birds stole it. Some of it fell where weeds and the cares of this world, and the distractions of life came up and choked it out. Some of it fell on rocks where hardness of heart because of persecution and problems, because of the Word of God arose. In other words, 75% of the seed got stolen by distractions. Only 25% landed on good soil where it brought forth fruit. Could it be that in our lives that there is much seed getting stolen? That God is speaking, He is pouring into us, and so much of it, don't turn me off now, is being taken away by the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. In the Bible, Mary and Martha were squabbling back and forth. Well, really, it was just Martha who was squabbling. Jesus had showed up at their house. The king of kings is in their living room. Just think about that for a second. The king of kings is in their living room giving a Bible study. I don't know about you, but that might demand my attention. That might tell me my agenda is off for today. But the Bible says that Martha was distracted by much serving. She was doing a good thing that was keeping her from the best thing. Might it be that some of us, including myself, get caught up in such busyness of doing good stuff that we're missing the best stuff. And it's, and it's why we find ourselves dry and distracted and in a barren place. And finally, it says in verse 41 of Luke 10, And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about what? Many things. She's not focused. She's distracted. He says in verse 42, but one thing is necessary, is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, and I've always loved this phrase, which will not be taken from her. It won't be taken from her. I promise you this. According to the Word of God, if you will set aside time for Him, especially at the beginning of the day, you will have time the rest of the day to do what needs to be done. Amen. If you will take that first even just 10 minutes and devote it to Him, and you give it to Him, now all of a sudden He's been invited into everything else. 
And all the rest of that time is blessed. You know, the Bible says, redeem the time for the days are evil. Make the most of every moment. Somebody hearing this, come on church. Come on. She's chosen that most important part, that one thing. And he says, it won't be taken from her. In other words, if you will, oh, write this down. If you will make time for God, he will make time for you. You, you, your productivity will go through the roof. Amen. Amen. Everything that would have taken forever because now you've got God's presence and blessing on you while you're doing it. You've got His peace of mind while you're doing it. You've got His joy while you're doing it. All of a sudden, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the fruit of the Spirit is flowing into your life. Oh my goodness. And everything that's happened. Hey, listen, and then you face that weird co-worker. You face that strange person family member, whoever it is, and you just love them anyways. And they're like, what's wrong with her? (laughs) What they've been drinking? Holy Ghost, thank you very much. Some of us need to drink more Holy Spirit before we go face this world. Amen? Make time for God and He'll make time for you. I will say this with all the love in the world. Post less and pray more. Spend a little less time on Facebook and let's get our face in the book. Because if we abide in Him and His words abide in us, we'll ask what we desire and it shall be done for us. If we ask anything according to His will, that's what His Word promises us. A little less Google and a lot more God. Amen. When I was down in Charleston, Chris, Chris was with me. There was a pastor who that afternoon was going to go sit with the governor. I don't know if you remember this, but he looked over another pastor and he pulled out this list of things. And, and he said to the pastor, he said, is there anything I should add or anything you want me to talk to the governor about? In other words, he wasn't just going to go to the governor and like the governor say, so what do you need? And him say, well, I'm not really sure. He, he prepared himself. And he knew what he was going to talk about. And listen what Jesus says here in Matthew 6, 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Do you know a lot of unbelievers pray? In fact, according to Jesus, some of them pray a lot. And they do not pray God's way. A lot of you think that only Christians pray. Listen, all kinds of heathens pray, all kinds of false religions pray, people all around the world are praying, not just you. And not all of them are approaching God the way His Word says to. And says, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you Ask them. Some of you are giving me this strange look. Have you ever been called by someone and they just start talking? They don't even pause. You say hello and they just let loose. And then about two minutes into it, you're sitting there thinking, I wish I knew who this was. (laughs) And at some point, you have to have that embarrassing interruption of, I don't mean to sound rude, but who is this? <laughs> and, and they're rambling on about the dog, the cat, the woman at Walmart, what so-and-so said at work, da 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 and it's, it's just this spewing of stuff. And, and you ever had conversations with people like that, and you're sitting there thinking, just be real, you don't have to look, please don't look at your spouse right now. <laughs> but you're thinking, what, is there any point to this entire story? <laughs> Where are you going with this? And I don't mean to to, to make light of this, but I think a lot of people are coming to God unprepared and just rambling on. And God is saying, I want you to be specific and ask me. I want you to be specific and talk to me. What's actually on your heart? What's actually bothering you? What actually are you seeking me for? Come on, church. Because see, what we're going to find is that prayer, it isn't so much about us getting God to do something. It's about God getting us ready so He can trust us with the answer to our prayers. 
as we pray, because Jesus goes on, listen to what he says. He says, therefore, don't be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. But He tells us to pray anyways. And some of y'all, this is going to go over your head, but some of y'all are going to get it. Your prayer is preparing you for your petition. Your prayers are preparing you for the promise that you've been standing on. Your prayers are, are preparing you for the purpose that you have been created for. Your prayers are preparing you for the promotion that you've been believing Him for. And you've been seeking Him after. See, the greatest thing that's happening in your prayers isn't even going to be the answer to the prayer. It's going to be the miracle that happens in you because you've been spending time with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The biggest miracle is that I'm being transformed from glory to glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Every time I get in that prayer closet, I'm getting transformed because I'm beholding the face of the King a little more, a little closer, a little deeper. And He's changing me and He's molding me and He's getting me ready for everything that He has for me. And so when we show up, we don't just ramble and we find our focus. We shut the door. We remove the distractions. And number two, praying God's way means finding your form. What do I mean by form? And some of y'all don't think this sounds religious, but I could use the word formula. And it's scriptural. It's scriptural. See, some of you all think that being led by the Spirit is like taking your brain and, and ripping it off your head or something. That's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus is going to show us how to pray, and it's going to have a form to it, a formula, if you will. And what we call, it's what we call the Lord's Prayer. And really, the truth of the matter is, it's not a prayer that the Lord prayed. It's the prayer that He taught His disciples to pray. And so it's really not the Lord's prayer at all. It's our prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. And may I say it this way, it's the model prayer. It is the model or the formula for effective prayer. Some of you are offended and you're not taking notes anymore. Because you thought that rambling on was just what God wanted. No, He wants you to get to the point. He says He wants you to ask specifically and directly. And so the Bible... Listen, when I was in Sunday school, and I'm thankful for this, we memorized the Lord's Prayer. We opened up Sunday school reciting the Lord's Prayer. And I'm glad we did because I learned it. And I learned it the right way in Old King James. Thank you very much. Yes! Sounds funny every other way. But Jesus didn't say, let's look here. He didn't say, recite this pray. He said, pray this way. In other words, He's not saying, go around and recite this thing. He's saying, I want you to use this as a model to follow. And so I want us to go through this. And and you have notes, and I encourage you, if you don't take notes, to start taking notes. Uh, listen, I, that's not me who just says that. Studies show you will learn four times as much at least if you will write and not just listen. I didn't say that. That was said by somebody else. But it's true. Love and honor is how we begin our prayers. Matthew 6, 9. See, we become to God in this loving relationship. What does He say? In this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. We don't think of this now, but in the Old Covenant, they did not call God their Father. Because they were not in that covenant relationship with Him. Is somebody hearing this? And and, and you don't say, my Father. We're part of a family. We're part of this huge family of God. Our Father. I don't just get to come to God in any old way as my Creator. I come to Him not even just as my Savior. I come to Him as Father, Son. Yeah, yes, wow! Yeah. And not only me, we all get to do this. Everyone here who is born again gets to say, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be Your name. So we begin with love, but then hallowed be Thy name. Honor Him. 
To hallow His name isn't just to not take it in vain. I'm not just talking about what the heathen think is His last name. I'm talking about honoring His name in our lives. Let me ask it this way. Is what I'm doing, what I'm thinking about, what I'm meditating on, will that bring honor to the name of God or not? When I say, hallowed be your name, I'm saying in every part of my thoughts, my life, my actions, my home, my plans, may they all honor and lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Hallowed be your name. The word hallowed means to be holy and consecrated and honored. And I want you to see something here. Praying God's way all begins about Him before I ever get to me. It's all about Him. And when we get in our proper relationship with Him, then He is ready to hear about us. But the first thing He says is, we've got to be in right relationship with each other before I can move in your life. See, that's what prayer is going to do. It's going to position you for the answer. The next thing we do is we invite and surrender. Invite and surrender. He says, your kingdom come. We're inviting the kingdom into our lives, into our marriages, into our homes, into our situations. Your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. Someone once said, prayer is a mighty instrument not for getting man's will done in heaven, but for getting God's will done on earth. And so we come to Him and we invite Him. Your kingdom come. I want His kingdom in my home. I want His kingdom in my marriage. I want His kingdom in this church. I want His kingdom in our community. I want to see His kingdom come in our schools, into our businesses, into our courthouse. He walked into the White House. I want to see His kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so now we're inviting Him and we are surrendering ourselves to His will. What is His will? The Bible says He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so that my life will be lined up in such a way that He can use me, move through me, my family, so that the most souls can be won, that the most lives can be changed for eternity. I tell you what, you begin to pray this way, God will respond to you. Then you go on. The next point is prayer, provision and petitions. Provision and petitions. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Provision and petition. I'm asking you, Lord, right now to meet me where I am today. Listen, when Israel gathered the manna, some of them, they were told, only get as much as you need, because if you get too much tomorrow, it'll be spoiled. And of course, a lot of them didn't listen. And so what did they do? They got a whole heap of it. They couldn't eat it all. The next morning, their house stunk to high heaven, because yesterday's manna goes bad. And God was saying to them, I want you to keep coming back to me every day. Day after day. Because I want you to keep feeding. Jesus said my words, they are spirit and life. He says, I am the bread of life. Who? Why is the church starving and its prayers ineffective? Because it doesn't eat. We talk about 21 days of fasting and we all think we're going to die. But the truth of the matter is we've already been dying. Because we already don't eat. Give us the... It is just assumed as a Christian, you will get daily bread. It is just assumed as a believer, i got to say this, that Sunday morning will not be the only time you ever eat. Because if you did that in the natural, you'd have been dead a long time ago. And yet we wonder why we're struggling so much. We need the bread of His Word, of His presence, and of His provision. And this is the time in prayer where you can begin to lift up other things as well. 
You can begin to talk about the other needs in your life. The, uh, listen, maybe other people that you're praying for. Other situations. Maybe there's a storm going on and you're interceding for their safety. Maybe there's someone going through a hard time. You begin to lift up these petitions to God because now He's in that. You've positioned yourself. You've humbled yourself. You've surrendered yourself. You've invited His kingdom into your life and you're feeding on His presence and His Word. He is El Shaddai church. When Jesus fed the multitude with five loaves and two fish, the Bible's not that that's not a horrendous miracle, but when you read it, you realize that God is not the God of barely enough. Because when they were done, they didn't just take up one or two, they took up 12 baskets of leftovers. When you're praying for provision, come to God like He's God. He wants us to ask and He wants us to ask big. The next step is forgiven and forgiveness. He says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our faults, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and do what? Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I'm so thankful that the Father is so forgiving. But He, he gives it in such a way, He says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our... And the word as, if you're taking notes, means in the same way. Or just like I do. God, I want you to forgive me just like I forgive others. A lot of y'all wouldn't have been reciting this prayer all these years had you known that's what you were saying. <laughs> because time and time again, if pastors don't do it, but if we were asking, is there somebody in your life you're angry with? If we were real, there'd be a lot of raised hands. And it's hindering our prayer life. Like we don't even realize. Why, Why would the Father do this? Because we're family. I can be on the best vacation in the world, and I'm dad, and I'm driving, and we're seeing the most beautiful countryside. We're going to the greatest place on planet Earth. And it's wonderful until there's two boys in my back seat that begin to do this. You know what I'm talking about? And you can just be in the, like in the best mood, having the best atmosphere, and all of a sudden that squabbling, what does it do to the atmosphere? It begins to go downhill, and it begins to go downhill. And listen, now I'm upset. And, and listen, one of those boys may just want to then snuggle up to me, but they've, he's, he's mad at his brother, and his brother's over there crying. You know what I'm going to say? You need to go make it right with him. A lot of us are trying to snuggle up to dad and dad wants us to make up. Because we're spoiling the atmosphere. He's saying, I want to, I want, I want to spend time with you, son, but we've got to get this right first. Because the whole atmosphere in the family right now is getting spoiled. We need to make those things right. God wants unity in His community. He says how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the oil upon the head of Aaron running down on the beard, running down over the edge of his garments. It's like the dew coming from Mount Hermon descending on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing and life everlasting. Psalm 133. The presence and peace and anointing and power of God is always prevalent where His people are at peace with one another. He wants the family to get along. The next step is guidance and protection. There's just two more steps here. Guidance and protection. Matthew 6.13 says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is such a powerful prayer that some people don't understand, but and what he's in essence saying is, Lord, keep me from things that I'm not even ready to handle yet. And if I am, listen, the Bible says, let no one say he's tempted of God. God never tempted any man. But what he's saying is, is this, is that if I find myself in a place of temptation that you didn't keep me from, 
The Bible also says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but with every temptation will give us a way of escape that we may endure it. And so we're saying, God, keep me from any kind of mess that I'm not ready for. And if I do get in the mess, show me the exit door. And give me enough good sense to run to it. <laughs> Amen? See, there's a lot of us, we, we, we just need to go into better temptation management. In other words, you aren't praying this, you're not walking this way, so you keep putting yourself in situations that you're not ready for. I'm not picking on one particular sin here, but if I'm trying to quit smoking, I probably shouldn't keep a whole carton with an ashtray and a lighter on the kitchen counter. Right? Come on, quit being so serious. I need to get the temptation out of the house and then I won't struggle so bad anymore. But when it's glaring at me in the eyes, and so many of us are walking into places and things and with people that God is saying, if you would just cut that off. He's saying it's, it's not that you can't overcome it, it's just that you keep running into it. If I know there's a pothole on the road and I hit it once, that makes sense. But if I hit it every morning for three years in a row... Swerve around the thing. I don't know why I keep having to get this truck realigned. And nah, 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 nah. I keep having to buy new tires. Because you keep hitting the same holes, dummy. Move around it. <laughs> News flash. Some of us have been watching Groundhog Day for way too long. <laughs> Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm not sure if I should recommend that movie, so... If you watch it, I didn't tell you to. <laughs> Temptation management is the best policy. But you know, we end it all with praise, praise, and more praise. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. God, it's your kingdom, my life, my marriage, my home, my family, my everything. It's all yours. And without you, I can do nothing. Yours is all the power. I rely completely on you. Because without you I can do nothing. But I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. And you get all the glory for it all. You, everything's pointing back to you. Everything I have came from you. And it's for you and it's to you, Lord. Whew. Just a few more nuggets. Is this alright? Most of you know this, but I want to throw it in there. John 16.24 Jesus said, until now, you have asked nothing in my name. The word name means the authority, the reputation. You haven't asked the Father anything in my name. Ask and you will receive. That your joy may be full. Why do we ask in Jesus' name? Because He's the one with all the authority. And so when I approach the Father through the name of His Son, He says, you shall receive. Listen, saying in Jesus' name is not just a nice little addendum to the end of your prayer. It is your, your access. It's your card to get into His presence. Does that make sense? We come through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so I approach the throne boldly, not based on what I've done, but based upon what He's done. But I know when I come in confidence through His sacrifice that He hears my prayers and I receive the answers to my prayers. Learn to pray in Jesus' name. Learn to pray in His name. I, I heard a funny story about a, a lady. She was a very, very devout Catholic and meant very well. And a, a pastor walked in that she knew was Protestant. And he began to, sh to invite her to church. And she told him where she went to church. And she said, the thing that upsets me about you guys, she says, you, you all don't love Mary. Like that was her impression. And he could tell that she had a heart for the Lord. And at that moment, he could have rebuked her and shot her down, you know, and... But the Holy Spirit checked him and he said, no, he said, we have a lot of respect for Mary. She, God used her to bring the, our Savior into the world. He said, she said, well, but you don't pray to her. And in that moment, he really could have rebuked her. And, 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 she, and he said, no, he said, 
we, we do something more to show her respect. He said, we pray like Mary prayed. And, and, and she said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, the Bible tells us how Jesus taught Mary and the other disciples to pray. And so we, not, no, we, we show respect. We, we pray just like Mary prayed. He said, would, would you like to learn how to pray how Mary prayed? And she's like, oh, yeah. I want, to, I want to pray like Mary prayed. And he began to open up these scriptures about praying in Jesus' name, about how to pray in faith. And, and so she went back to her, to her, to she had like a, a home Bible study. And, and she sat down, and, and the, next, the next time they sat down, she looked at the whole group and she said, Listen, tonight we're going to do something different. Tonight we're going to learn how to pray like Mary prayed. And the next thing you know, you've got this whole Catholic Bible study praying in faith according to the Word of God in Jesus' name. The priest finds about it and he shows up and he's like, what's going on with this? And they're like, well, listen, we're going to show you how Mary prayed. Next thing you know, the, the, past, the pr priest is not doing this anymore. He's praying in Jesus' name. <laughs> praying Mary, the, way, the way Mary prayed is praying God's way. And when we pray God's way, we get God's answers. Whew. That's, Wow. Paul, I want to bring up one other thing that's so common that, and some people wonder why though, is like, well, what, what's the deal with the tongues thing? And, and Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. And so he says, I pray with the tongue, I pray with, you know, I pray with the understanding. Listen, he went on to say this, and I think it's in verse 2, that he who, who prays in a tongue edifies himself because what's happening is because he's prayed in the spirit not his mind the biggest hindrance to my prayer life and yours is right here this thing takes me on every rabbit trail that's ever been created and when I pray in the spirit when I pray in my prayer language I sh that gets short circuited the, the short circuit in the line gets bypassed and now I'm praying from spirit to God, whom the Bible says is spirit. Somebody hearing this. And in that perfect communion, I'm getting edified, which means to be built up spiritually. And so the Bible, that's why Paul said, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than all of you. How is it that the most powerful, effective apostle was the one who prayed in tongues and got edified more than anybody else? Might there just be a connection? And we know he's talking about his prayer language. He says, I'm not talking about speaking in church. He said, it's between me and God. And so it says in Jude 1.20, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Get built up praying. Listen, the Bible says in Romans 8.26 that we often don't know how to pray as we ought. How many of you have faced like a really tragic situation where you didn't know what to say, you didn't know how to pray? The Bible says He makes intercessions with a force with groanings which cannot be uttered, cannot be spoken with the human tongue. And it says that He makes intercession for us according to the will of God. If you want to pray God's perfect will, and remember, prayers of His will get answers, pray in the Spirit. Because yeah, the Holy Spirit is saying exactly what the Father is wanting said. Come on. And while it's happening, you're getting built up spiritually. You're not only getting the answer to your prayer, you're getting stronger in, in the anointing and the presence of God and your relationship with God. Why tongues? I, my total response is, why in the world not tongues? Why in the world not? Why on earth would I say, do I have to? No, it's like, do I really get to? Praise God! Praise God. I don't think there's anybody here that would say, you know, I'm just a little too edified, Pastor. I came here and I'm just already too encouraged and too built up and too close to God as it is. I don't think I need to pray. I don't need a prayer language. We all know that's silly and it's not true. It's not true for me and it's not true for you. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Rejoice always. Always be joyful. There's something about a joyful spirit that attracts the presence. And then he goes on to say, pray without...
pray all the time. Yes, we do and have that time where we get alone in the closet, but we can talk to God wherever we are. Pray all the time, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. And he says, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Keeping an attitude of gratitude. Staying in that spirit of thanksgiving and joy. It invites the presence. Remember, we end our prayer with praise, praise, praise. And part of praise is thanksgiving. Giving thanks in all things, no matter the situation. And might I say the best part of praying God's way isn't really the answer to our prayers alone. It's that you are getting the chance to become intimate with your Heavenly Father and your Creator. That's the best part of all of it. Because the whole point of all of this is Him. When it all boils down, it's all about Him. Abraham had been given an amazing, amazing miracle at a hundred years of age. His wife Sarah, 90, he's given a miracle child, Isaac. And they raise that son. He's the son of promise. And the scriptures, according to the scriptures, a lot of us think that when the story I'm going to tell that he was still very young, but actually he would have been an adult. A young, a young adult, but an adult nonetheless. And, and God says to Abraham one day, He says, take your son, your only son, on Mount Moriah and give him to me as a burnt offering. And Jesus Himself had said, unless you love me more than your mother and father, son and daughter, brother, sister... You can't be my disciple. And he hears what God says and it makes no sense. We sang a song this morning that says, in the middle of the mystery, the thing I don't understand. This makes no sense. Why would God tell him to take the promise and sacrifice it? The one he loves so much, but... He obeys and he goes and he gets a couple of his servants and, he, and they get, grab a few donkeys and they head out towards Mount Moriah. It's a three-day journey. By the way, Mount Moriah <laughs> is where the Son of God would one day listen. And they travel up the mountain so far and he looks over at the servants and he says, you'll all stay here with the donkeys. We're going to go on a little further and worship. And some of you right now, you may be trying to take some people and things with you closer to God, and they're not ready. And you may have to choose. Am I going to stay with them and miss God? Or am I going to cut that cord and press on up the mountain? And so he goes just with his son and he's carrying the wood and they're carrying the fire. And Isaac looks up and says, Father, I see the wood and I see the fire. He said, but where's the sacrifice? And he says, God will provide Himself a lamb. He provided Himself as the lamb. And Abraham builds that altar out of stones and lays the wood down and Isaac willingly lays down, trusting the Father. And Abraham goes so far in obedience to raise the knife. All the while, God has not said anything else. He gave him one instruction. But all the while, he's walking in faith and he's walking in the presence of God. And he's learning to follow that still small voice. 
that whisper. That even as he raises his knife, he hears the whisper of God, Abraham, Abraham, do not kill your son. Because now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from him your son, your only son. And he looks over to the side and he sees way up high on the mountain a ram with its head caught in the thickets. And from what we understand, even in Israel at high altitudes, the rams, they don't go up there. He was completely out of place. And I want you to see something here. As Abraham pressed towards God in faith, not knowing what was going to happen, the answer was coming up the other side of the mountain. When Abraham got where God was taking him, the answer was there. There is nothing like knowing His still small voice. And there's nothing and nobody worth that. Whatever He asks us to leave behind, whoever He asks us to leave behind, to be that close to Him, it's so worth it. The most important part of praying God's way is that you get Him. The best answer to your prayer is that you will know Him. And, and you will be the strange person in the room that just walks into glory. And when everybody else says, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? You're hearing from heaven. And you don't know everything, but you know what the next step is. And the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And He delights in His way. Hallelujah. Here this morning, church, your steps, God wants to ordain them. And you may not know every step, but take the next step. It's ordered by God. And the Bible says if you stumble, He won't let you fall. But He will uphold you with His mighty right hand. I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. But I know the one who does. And I know that if I follow Him, I'll end up where I need to be. I'll have everything I need. Because that ram is coming up the other side of the mountain. Because the Son of God has already gone before me. He's already made the way through the cross. Your answer has already been won. Your victory has already been achieved. I want to ask our worship team to come forward this morning. And God is saying to Cornerstone, to us as, as His children, to some of us as parents, some of us as grandparents, some of us with different positions or non-positions, who cares about the titles? But He's saying to us, church, it's time to unleash the power of praying God's way. It's time to come to God according to the Word of God and pray to God as God intended us to. That is, a, that is what God is calling His church to. It's time for us to ascend the mountain of the Lord and see what He has to unleash in His people. Come on, church. If you aren't awakened by this, it's not because I didn't preach the Word. It's not because you can't feel the Holy Ghost all around you. There is nothing, hallelujah, that's holding you back besides you. God is saying this morning, come on, church. Let us rise. Let us press on up the mountain. Let us stand, church. And let us press into His presence. Watch Him unleash His power and His glory like we've never seen before. It's time we lay down the distractions and the things of this world and we find our focus and our form and we come and approach His throne with boldness and confidence through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Because the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. Amen.